All right. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. And today we're going to talk about a method that I uh, kind of canned. It's called the uh, uh, LIP method, uh, licensing, uh, uh, in other words, layered intellectual property. And what this means is we want to look at intellectual property, not as an event, not as an it, but as a process and also a sub process when we are looking at what we want to uh, uh, do in the world and certainly for intellectual property. And the first question I often get asked, especially when I teach is what is the value of intellectual property or even before that what is the value of an idea and i will give you a true story once a client came in uh they had a patent newly issued patent brand new patent i said this is interesting you got a new patent uh what is it worth uh they said and this is a direct quote a billion dollars and then i said hmm billion dollars well how long will it take you to reach that billion dollar mark and he said very straight faced one year um so th the issue i'm getting at is you know intellectual property ideas aren't worth anything unless you have an organization a system behind them and i reminded him that in the whole history of capitalism uh, there has never been a company to go from zero to a billion revenue in one year based on one patent. Uh, the long story short is uh, ideas do not have value unless you do something with them, unless you have a system to go with them, and unless you layer some of these ideas on. So we love our stuff. You, know, you may be uh, having a long product development, and if you're in pharmaceuticals, you have human trials, you have all these things going on. At the end of the day, you've got to figure out what is it that actually creates value and how long is it going to take and what, what am I wrapping around that? So uh, I'm going to put up a, a survey. Um, and what I'd like to do is ask uh, what your level of uh, uh, knowledge is around intellectual property. Are you an expert? Do you know a lot about it? Do you not know a lot about it? And then we can get into more of the, the high level overview and then get into this layer system that I think will work for your company uh, as it has its kind of my go to for my clients. So uh, why don't we put that survey up and maybe we can get some feedback. Let's see. get to my polling. Okay, uh, vast majority have no other, uh, have some understanding and uh, looks like uh, very few have no understanding. Um, nobody says they're an expert on it, so which is good. Uh, and we will hopefully give you a very simple way to remember each of the major flavors, if you will, of intellectual property by these three different um, uh, the definition icon bullet points that can hopefully cement them in your uh, memory as to what type of intellectual property is being talked about and what I should do to protect it or not protect it because you may not want to protect it. So back to my thing. At the end of the day, ideas aren't worth a lot because there's a lot of ideas. They are if you have a system process and actually think about a form of intellectual property that works with them that you can actually uh, get uh, protected. Uh, Ocean Tomo, this is an IT, uh, uh, in, sorry, IP intellectual property brokerage firm in Chicago, uh, estimates that approximately 81% of the Standard & Poor's market cap uh, is, S&P 500 market cap, is intangible rights, intellectual property. And when I saw that number, I was like, that can't be right. But when you think about it, what would um, Nike be without their brand presence, their logo? Uh, what would Intel be without patents? What would uh, Coca-Cola be without trade secrets? Uh, some of these things that we think uh, can't possibly have value, uh, they do. 
if I cannot differentiate my product in the work, in the marketplace, then it becomes generic. It's hard for me to compete if people can't tell the difference. If what I do is special, if there's a certain level of quality, a certain level of vigor in my research and my development, then those products generally have a lot more value than uh, just a more generic uh, effort. So layers, that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna explain about this concept of layers. It's something that I want you to get familiar with and see intellectual property as a very broad spectrum because a lot of people think intellectual property, uh, that's a patent. Yeah. Patent is a type of Linux property. So are these other things that can actually help you compete that are much more effective at helping you compete than just one strategy. Let's say, hey, patents is, patenting is gonna be our strategy and it certainly should be if you're in you know, biotech or uh, engineering or certainly electronics, but there's a lot of other layers we're gonna put in. We're going to go into the IP review right now, and then I'm going to go one by one on the five layers. There's five layers we're going to cover today that your organization should probably have a pretty good handle on. So there's only four things that provide value from the intellectual property uh, perspective. They are utility, has to do something, expression, I'm saying something or expressing myself in a new and exciting and different way. Uh, I have a identification of something, a source identifier of whether or not that's my technology, whether or not that's my um, service, my good, myself or whatever. And fourth, I have a competitive advantage I want to protect by doing certain things. And certainly the law really protects these things or it gives us uh, tools to protect these things. And this all goes back to some uh, interesting things that happened at the founding of America and the US Constitution. Long story short, uh, Thomas Jefferson went abroad and found how backwards America was. And he said, well, how do these countries, what do these countries do to incent people to like make a better mousetrap, to innovate more, to have better art? He was very, in his travels to France, he was very impressed with the art. And in America, he said, we have to kind of have something like that. And indeed in the constitution early on, there are incentives and there was a lot of discussion about, do we want to give people a limited monopoly or should it be, you know, America is about freedom. Should we just make it free for everyone? And it was decided, no, we like property. And then there was a labor theory where we don't want people to work for free. So if you spend a lot of time inventing a device or making a painting or uh, composing a, a symphony or an opera, we want to protect you from a, you know, a labor standpoint to get something back. And that's where a lot of these intellectual property theories, it was absolute property right and this kind of labor theory about, you know, we don't want people to work for free. Um, next in the uh, idea of intellectual property, I want to talk about the four major flavors. Now there are more of intangible rights broadly and I'll briefly hit on those, but there's four basic intellectual property rights most companies have got to be really good about. It has to flow not only to workforce knowledge of what these are, but also into your processes, how you protect it because each intellectual property flavor is not protected the same way. Contractors have different rights than full-time employees. If you acquire something from another company, there are things you have to do to ensure that those rights come unencumbered. So let's go into it. And right now I'm gonna give you three basic things you'll need to know about each of these major flavors. And we'll go into some minor ones as well. But right for now, let's talk about copyright. Copyright, the three things I want you to remember about copyright. They're original works of authorship. In other words, they're original, new, someone made them, employee, maybe a contractor, um, maybe yourself, uh, a fixed intangible form, and creative expression is protected, not utility. For example, 
There's a famous case regarding a bottle uh, that had a ornamental shape, an ornamental top. And the court said, well, that top that you're trying to uh, enforce as a registered copyright as a piece of sculpture because copyright protects anything in tangible form. What is tangible form? It can be sculpture, it can be written word, it can be movies, sound, it can be fixed in your random access memory of your computer and that's been litigated. Anything that you can recall and has tangible form and people can perceive by their senses, including music, uh, that is a copyrightable event, a copyrightable piece of property. So with this, back to this bottle case, uh, the court said, well, that bottle top did not have sufficient uh, expressive content. It was more useful and functional. Therefore, you cannot own a copyright in that bottle top. Uh, it is simply useful. Uh, theoretically, you could patent it. Probably not because bottle top openings are pretty much uh, any monopoly has probably been expired, but that is a differentiation. Copyright can't be useful. It's expressive content. It is not something that does anything. We'll look to patent to help us understand a little bit about what that is. And here is patent. The three things that we have to remember about patent are pretty straightforward. It has to be something novel, something new. It has to do something. And I, I'm not going to talk about design patents, which are articles of manufacture whose shape and form you can protect, but we're not going to talk about that. It's kind of arcane. Uh, it's closer to copyright law. Uh, but uh, utility patents, which most uh, medical device manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, uh, it, certainly anyone doing electronics or uh, any type of uh, transformative technological uh, uh, com computational devices, they have to do something. They have to be useful. They have to have utility. And they have to be non-obvious. This means that no general person can just figure it out. And this, this is important. The important point here is non-obvious to someone ordinarily skilled in the art. In other words, if I had a, say, circuit diagram and I had a, uh, it, my diagram requires 10 ohms, and uh, I didn't have any 10 ohm capacitors and I uh, put two five ohm uh, standard unit for resistance. Uh, if, if I back up those two, that's obvious. I mean, uh, uh, putting uh, two capacitors in a row to equal the total amount of resistance you need is obvious to anyone doing electronics assembly, non-advancement over the art. So that would be refused. That would not be allowed by the patent office. So not obvious means you have to have a certain skill. If I'm developing a new pharmaceutical, it would have to be someone who is a biochemist. Uh, theoretically, if it's obvious to them, not patentable. If it's really creative and innovative, essentially a better mousetrap where they put some brain power into it, some figuring, some sweat of brow as, well, as it were, that is allowable for patent protection. And yeah, patents, it's, there's strong patents and weak patents. There's, you know, claim writing, all that science or art of uh, patent prosecution is something that determines the uh, strength of the patent. And we'll talk about how they're used in our layering system. I want to talk about trademarks for a minute. This is a source identifier. It has to be unique. In other words, people have to differentiate it in the marketplace, has to form a different mental picture in the person's head has to identify and it has what we call secondary meaning. In other words, uh, what's the meaning that the person assigns to that? For example, I have gone to Starbucks in you know, New York, in San Francisco, in LA, in Indonesia, in Singapore, and I know Starbucks has a very consistent product. I generally know what a Starbucks cup of coffee will be like. If I'm not feeling uh, you know, risky and I don't want to go to a local shop, I just want something where I know that's what the mark means to me, the Starbucks mark, the name and logo. And that has a secondary meaning in my head, you know, standard product quality, I know what I'm getting, uh, low risk buy, maybe some things uh, I may want to do when I 
look to that mark for what I do. And the first mark ever was the, if any of you drink beer, the Bass Triangle mark, which was uh, affixed on the casks of ale in England. Uh, and people didn't need to be literate. They knew if they saw the red triangle, they probably would not get dysentery from drinking that beer. Whereas the triple X barrel, well, you may, may be a risk. So the very first trademark was a source identifier. It was unique. People saw it. It had secondary meaning. You can have a monopoly on that shape, that logo, that color, that um, the overall view, what we call trade dress. And all trademarks are not equal. Some are stronger. Some are weaker. And let's look at this little continuum uh, uh, for what the strong marks are. They are basically stuff that's as they say, fanciful or stuff made up. If you make up a word and you associate it with your good or service, that is a strong mark. For example, Intel Centrino, that's not a real word. They made it up. Trademark registration they filed with the US Patent Trademark Office got the trademark. It can be arbitrary. Okay, Amazon is a river in Brazil. I use it for an online retailer. That's a strong mark because I have an association what Amazon means. It doesn't mean the river. It's when I'm online, it means I want to buy some uh, whatever. Good. A book, maybe. Uh, a suggestive mark is kind of the mashup of the trademark world. This has to do with taking two things that's suggestive of it. Uh, microcomputer software, mash it together. Microsoft, that's a great mark. Now we get into the sketchy marks, the ones that aren't very strong as far as federal trademark law, federal trademark law. Uh, one is descriptive. Um, Intel Inside was a mark that Intel tried to, to uh, get a registered mark, but the Patent Trademark Office said, uh, you are telling us what's inside the computer. That's descriptive, descriptive, you're not allowed federal registration, but you can use common law, which is superscript TM. Anytime you use a mark, you have certain common law rights, judge-made law rights that will protect the mark. You don't get all the bennies uh, of federal registration. Generic marks, these are things that are um, descriptive, totally descriptive, or they may have even fallen out. For example, uh, pharmaceutical company, company Bayer or chemical company at the time, uh, salicylic acid was aspirin. Uh, they had the trademark aspirin. Eventually, other people started using it until it became generic. Aspirin, to me now and to most people, doesn't mean bare aspirin. Uh, Bayer is a trademark. Aspirin is no longer because they let it go. And recovering a generic mark is very hard. It can be done. Uh, Kimberly Clark uh, recaptured the word Kleenex. Kleenex or facial tissue was used generically. They must lose, lost the mark in the 50s, as the story is told. Uh, they were able to recapture it. Um, so these are some different things we think about with the uh, area of source identification, how I know quality based on a word. And we will give you a monopoly in that word for as long as you want it. As long as you use it and comply with the law, trademark potentially is perpetual. Uh, a patent, just to back up, 20 years. Uh, copyright seven years plus the life of the author or in the corporate world about 100 years. Trade secrets. Um, we're going to talk about how this layer is really important, but there's three components to the trade secret. Uh, it's something you keep secret. You cover with a non-disclosure agreement. It has to have actual or prospective economic value, and it has to give you some type of competitive advantage. It doesn't have to be... Um, Actual, it can be perspective. You know, I hope this will help me compete. But if you don't keep it secret, if you don't have evidence of keeping that mark secret, you will really struggle with maintaining a trade secret. You know, I have been in federal court and the first thing the judge will say is, where's the evidence? Or they'll look to, where's the evidence of you keeping what you're claiming secret and is yours secret? If you do not have evidence of non-disclosure agreements, of uh, contractually binding people not to talk about this formula or whatever, uh, that is not a secret. Uh, if, you, if someone on your staff is a PhD professor in biochemistry and he wants to tell the world in a uh, 
symposium on how awesome this technology is and how it's useful. That's public disclosure. You basically have a year to file the patent or it's in the public domain, which is a tension between academia and innovation. But you have to have that evidence of keeping it secret above all. The rest of the stuff is kind of speculative, uh, economic value uh, or competitive advantage. Um, the next thing I want to talk about are the more general things uh, of intangible rights that may apply to you. One are moral rights. Certainly, I just did a, an agreement today in Canada. Uh, Canada and uh, the EU uh, protect the rights of affiliation, association, integrity of artworks, and certainly some uh, the right to be associated with an invention. Uh, these are moral rights. Section 106A in the uh, copyright or copyright laws kind of. Um, part of the law uh, in America as applied, but it's less of a deal in the United States as it is in those areas I mentioned. Uh, there's other intangible rights, you know, domain name, social media, phone, you know, this has to help people finding you. Uh, when you transfer uh, rights, you want to make sure that's clean, uh, brand presence. Uh, sometimes if you have a, a you, even architecture, if you are a known brand and you have a certain layout, you may want to prevent people with the same layout, the same color scheme going into that. Even if you don't have what they call as a, a trade dress trademark, uh, you may want to uh, stop people. For example, if I had a donut shop with a pink theme and I had a very strong brand and my lease ended and I couldn't come to terms, I may even put in the lease that uh, the next person can't be a donut shop or can't be uh, use my pink color scheme or whatever. So those things are negotiated even in things. These are intangible rights. They're really not in the, the four core IP, copyright, trademark, trade secret, patent, but they are part of your intangible mix. I want to talk briefly about Creative Commons. Uh, this is not free stuff. It is licensed uh, technology, uh, licensed uh, creativity in the uh, area of Creative Commons. So that means you have to follow the license. And if you don't, you will be named as a defendant in a law school, uh, in a law school, in a, in a lawsuit. Um, what that happens is uh, organizations, nonprofits like the Electronic uh, 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 Frontier Foundations, EFF, will sue you if you are commercializing something that the authors uh, say you can't commercialize. So you have to read the license. I recently uh, helped a subscription company, software as a service company, uh, do a license. We use 12 different pieces of open source source uh, open source software to uh, make that service available. Uh, we had to, of course, review the licenses, disclose them to our users, and make sure that they have links to, to refer so they can police our use of the software. And those are some considerations when you're using um, open source. And it can interfere, it can taint uh, pejorative some of your technology but you've got to just figure out what's yours mine and ours and theirs once you separate those rights and know them find out what the terms are and then you'll have cleaner as we say ip and your company general will have a higher valuation if you use these systems so let's get to the systems uh by the way you can interrupt me anytime with a question i have my little uh, question q a screen here i uh I speak very fast and the, uh, of course, uh, sweetest sound to an attorney's ears or the sound of his own voice. So uh, please stop me and, and uh, ask if you, have, if you have some questions. So layer one has to do with the leadership of the organization. And this is important for the C-level to know, uh, do they, quote, get it? Do they understand what the intellectual property program means? Do they know what intellectual property is at a pretty deep level and how it can drive to that 81% value of their company? Now, this is what I call a culture of intellectual property valuation. Uh, what do I mean by that? It's it, very simple. Uh, we are talking about getting everyone from the sea level on down to be aware of intellectual property is. How do you become aware? You have to look in your own house and that begins with an IP audit. What 
uh, potential inventions are we have? What systems do we have? What are we trying to do in the marketplace right now? So I see a question from Michael, I'll answer right now. And by the way, any answer, I have to say that nothing I say today is intended as legal advice. This is educational. Uh, you should engage competent counsel in your jurisdiction to help you with these specific questions. The question is, please talk about novel algorithms for analysis of commonly available data. For example, I develop an algorithm for analysis uh, of personal genetic information and will sell it as a service. Is this the best strategy to protect its use? There's a lot of issues there. <laughs> uh, one of which is, um, what is patentable subject matter is kind of the core of the question. Uh, facts of nature are not. Uh, things that uh, mathematical formula are not application of them, how you process the data. If it has, according to a Supreme Court case fairly recently, it's probably a decade old, uh, decade old now, but if it transforms the information in some way that can help uh, get you that patent uh, if you want to prosecute it. But the patent is a public record. 18 months after you file that patent, it is public record. We let everyone see it. We open the file and say, you can make a better mousetrap. And here's what this guy did. If you want to uh, innovate, uh, you can do that. And sure, if uh, the next inventor, if she comes along and has a better mousetrap and she discloses, hey, I was inspired by this art, but mine is nothing like it. And let me tell you how, she will have a patent that may run parallel to that. Uh, it all depends, but um, collections of data, how you use data, uh, your processes, a lot of this is best kept uh, for um, uh, a lot of trade secret is what I would use as, as one of the layers. I would also look at patenting it as far as the public interface. What's the utility that the person, the user says, uh, sees about that genetic information? There's also a lot of regulation. I also am certified in privacy law. So you have a lot of uh, de-identification you have to do um, for that information. You know, there's not only HIPAA, there's a lot of other different privacy regimes you have to comply with when you start writing algorithms and using data to sell its use or aggregated data. And there's different levels of uh, anonymization that work. In my firm's newsletter, we just published an article and a blog post on this um, probably a couple, couple of months ago. So. A um, lot, of, lot of issues in that question, um, but let's get on. Thanks for the question. Awesome, Michael, hope that helped. Um, the first thing you need before you talk about what IP do I wanna go for is this confidentiality program where I wanna make sure people know not to talk to people about everything that goes on because they could be out, a competitor could be at the table, um, you know, it, it could be something else. Like I, I represent a lot of uh, couples that are in the tech community. They may work for very different companies. They may work for competitors. Um, they've got to have some type of formality uh, with confidentiality. It's a kind of a professional prerogative. I mean, I, this is a true story. Once I had uh, a client over for dinner, uh, my wife says, oh, that's great. Someone's coming for dinner. And at the end of it, she said, so who are those people? Uh, I'd never told her that it was a client that I, I uh, uh, had over for dinner because uh, disclosing that you're a client is actually the, the client's right. It's not your right. So you have to think about that level of professional confidentiality when you're thinking about company trade secret. You owe it to your employer, your shareholders, uh, the people who are investing in that tech. And you may, you may offer, uh, you may even... Uh, uh, owe it to yourself for, for self-respect. Um, so on leadership, you can take very different approaches to uh, a culture of intellectual property. And I, I give this example. Um, Jack Ma, of course, is the, the uh, CEO, the owner, uh, uh, innovator of Alibaba, which is a large uh, search engine um, uh, marketplace in uh, China, uh, they have a pretty structured intellectual property uh, enforcement provision uh, for it, where you 
put stuff up and things are enforced, you know, notice and takedown stuff, similar to the US model after the US, doesn't work as well as say Amazon or uh, section 512 with the copyright code notice and takedown provisions, but uh, he knows about it, he tries to comply with it, not always successfully. Um, that's a that's a way to manage intellectual property protection of people who use your platform. Uh, let's look at Elon Musk, who used intellectual property in a very different way in 2014. Um, at this is Tesla. Let's talk about Tesla for a minute. He had kind of the, the hall of patents. You see a lot of companies in their front entryway. They have all the bronze patents. Uh, well, in 2014, he basically gave away. He said. I'm gonna put these in the public domain. Anyone can use them because I want people to use this technology a lot. Probably done for PR, uh, which we're gonna talk about in a minute why you would do that. Uh, by the way, Tesla still files and enforces patents, but for, for that set, it was a very different approach. Uh, at the time, Tesla thought that was a good idea. Um, you know, the board said, this is good for us to do, and so they did it. So that has to speak to culture. What culture? For example, I uh, do represent some companies that do sell on Alibaba. Um, they have very low expectations of enforcement, whereas uh, uh, that's like one culture that you kind of know. If I'm a, uh, a shareholder of uh, Tesla and I feel like, hey, I really want to enforce these patent rights and collect all these patents. Um, for example, Boeing has tens of thousands of patents. You may uh, not want to invest in that company because it doesn't fit your personal culture as an investor. So that's why I mentioned these, uh, who, whatever the culture is in your investment community, in your worker community, you've got to think about how that reflects in what I'm doing on how my leadership is going to communicate these uh, intellectual property protection regimes and, and um, imperatives. Next, I really want to talk about capture because if the, level one is what's your confidentiality program next, you're going to have to say, okay, you're keeping it secret, but what is it? If I don't know what it is, I am not going to be a candidate for any type of registration. So what do I have to have in place for employees, vendors, or customers is, uh, first of all, employees and, and contractors who I uh, employ to invent, or uh, any uh, some such contractual or uh, uh, relationship. I'm gonna have something called an adventure disclosure agreement. It's a process um, through the years. Uh, yeah, my firms developed one. It's very um, uh, structured because whatever you use, you have got to memorialize that something cool was done and that somebody somewhere in the organization is gonna say, hey, how do we want to protect this? Is this what type of IP should we layer on this? And uh, do we want to do that? Do we want to invest the time, money, and resources to do this patent? Or is this more like a trade secret? Or is it not useful at all? Is it more expressive copyright? Or that's a really cool mashup of a word you're using, using your uh, literary license, do we want to turn that into a trademark for describe, uh, to describe this good or service? Those are issues you're going to have to decide, but you can't decide them if you don't have people reporting in, if you don't have the intelligence of all the people working in your company about, hey, I just came up with a better mousetrap. I came up with an idea. I came up with a good mark. Invention disclosure is a process you really want to look into. That begins with a lot of contract review. How you onboard and offboard people to your organization is pretty important, including vendors, contractors, because uh, generally uh, when employees work for you in the copyright sense, it's a work for hire. Uh, but in the patent sense, you do not have their inventions. They have got to assign those to you. You are, if they leave your company, you're left with, which is called a shop rate, which means you can practice that invention, that patent in your own shop, uh, but you can't sell it. You can't use it for commercial purposes. You can kind of play with it a little. Uh, whereas that innovation generally moves with the inventor absent an assignment. So employees have got to assign their patent rights, whereas copyrights are generally by default work for hire. Vendors, they own what they build, you know, the right generally stays with the vendors. So they've got to have a different set of agreements. You can't, I mean, just today, this morning, I was reviewing a 
agreement, it, it said employment agreement, but it was not an employment agreement. It was more like a contract agreement and it did not have the requisite intellectual property transfer uh, incantations um, that lawyers love to put in contracts. So those are some of the things that um, you want to be cognizant of. And certainly in the marketplace with your customers, your customers start telling you how to improve your stuff. Well, who owns that? Who owns the feedback? If you're not clear on that, if your customer engagement piece is not um, clear and legally sound, you could be watching your intellectual property slip through your fingers like grains of sand. Um, and for the last thing, uh, uh, you may acquire intellectual property by third parties who have proven it. They can't market it. They want to leave the market and you, you buy it from them. And that's all great. The one thing is once you buy a patent, you're going to get a, a transfer agreement, you know, IP transfer uh, contract uh, or copyright transfer or trademark, whatever. That's the private record. That's what you hold. You own it legally. If you look in the public record, if you didn't transfer that with, and you have to file transfer docs with, you know, USPTO, United States Patent and Trademark Office, or other authority, or the Copyright Office, uh, and someone thinks you're infringing, and I say I'm the seller, and I didn't do this extra step of making the public record reflect the private record, I will be named as a defendant, and I was in federal court in Seattle a few years ago over this very thing. It was an M&A deal. They did sloppy uh, IP clearing. They did not make the public record with the patent office reflect the private record between the parties. So it was bought, the, the IP was bought, but the world saw the public record that said it was not bought. It was still owned by the original innovator. They were named as a defendant and they had nothing. They had alienated the property. So a public record, private record has to be captured. Maybe I should have named layer two capture and alienation, alienation giving up of the intellectual property. So our third layer is perhaps the most important. It's what I call sub layers. So um, it's what I call layering awareness. This means, okay, where am I in this five layer system I'm rolling out? How do I get to the next level to create an awareness. When we come together, we have the invention disclosure. We're not telling anybody that. We're deciding what type of IP we want to do. Do we want to monetize it? Do we have a licensing program? These are things we want to look at. And here I have a cup of Starbucks, as you can tell. Uh, I generally don't get the cold drinks. I'm a coffee guy, but I am a caffeine addict. Um, you can look at this cup and you say, oh, that's like some Frappuccino. It's like a icy drink, uh, has a logo on it. You may say, oh, it's a trademark. And you would be right. They do have a trademark on the mermaid. But then you take another look and say, well, is there any other IP that can be associated with this? And the answer is absolutely. One piece of IP would be the, uh, artistic form of the mermaid. That is expressive content. It's kind of a work of art. They could file that for copyright protection if they do it within 90 days of publication. They are entitled to statutory rights as well. Now, uh, you can say, okay, uh, that's two areas. What about there's a uh, cardboard thing on it? Well, that's an insulator. So your hands don't get frosty. Um, believe it or not that the cup holder insulator ring was patented. I believe it's in the public domain, but there are new patents being filed on that same technology that are better, that they claim uh, if I wave the cardboard this way, it disperses heat better, it has more insulating properties, so you could actually file a patent on that ring. Moreover, I may have a secret way on how to keep that top of the cup from sealing well. Uh, years ago, I represented a container maker who wanted to do a green, you know, low carbon footprint containers. And the big trick was using these low carbon uh, containers, getting it to seal properly. And they didn't file a patent. They thought about it, but it required so much work. They decided just not to tell anyone trade secret. So in this little example, 
we have certainly the trademark logo. We have a copyright in the artwork of the logo. We have the potential patent on the insulation ring, and we potentially have a trade secret on how the article of manufacture of the container was developed. Uh, so this is what I call sub layers. So once you have your system in place, you're gonna look at everything that comes out of your company and make sure it is wrapped up in all the areas of intellectual property you care to enforce, that you care to use somehow. It may be for monetization, it may be for another reason. We'll get into those other reasons shortly. So let's talk about what those reasons may be. Layer four is strategy. I have the intellectual property. I've thought about what I want with, to do with that intellectual property as far as wrapping it, protecting it, sub layers on that innovation. What do I wanna do next? Uh, you have options. You ha just have to be clear on what business you're in because every company has limited resources, limited investment. Um, and you have to plan your goal and you have to monitor what's happening in the marketplace. So let's look at how we could use that. Uh, let's take a patent or any other right. You can use it as a sword. You can say, uh, have a monitoring service to look at your innovation and they will say, hey, we think this person is infringing and you can go after them in a lawsuit. Name as a defendant, get them to stop. There's a whole other section. Uh, you may have barred some uh, opportunity in the law, if you go strictly for the fight, it may have been a licensing opportunity and you have to word those uh, introductions very carefully. This is an important case called uh, uh, Hewlett Packard v. Acceleron, who is a, a patent, uh, non-practicing entity, NPE, pejoratively known as a patent troll, who went after HP for some type of technology in their servers and their letter was so aggressive uh, they gave HP the right, it's called declaratory judgment right, to attack their underlying patent right to federal court and undermine their claims. And that's exactly what HP did. So HP kind of smacked uh, Acceleron for, for their aggression. So there's a little bit of a dance you have to do before you start using that IP sword and getting a bunch of uh, defendants. Uh, Non-practicing uh, entities, NPEs, the trolls, um, there's... It can be a legitimate business thing. I don't want to sound too pejorative, but there's a lot of individuals uh, who do not belong in the tech business. For example, uh, I was uh, one of my clients got a demand letter from a, it was an, a Los Angeles based uh, person who had this awful demand letter. I said, this is hard. Yeah, who is this person? I looked them up. They were a real estate agent who somehow got a hold of a patent portfolio and started sending out these demand letters and didn't hire a counsel. And we basically told them the pound sand and they, we never saw them again. Um, so there's pretty low threshold on what it takes to be a patent portfolio holder. Uh, the more professional companies that do it, uh, Ignition Partners in, in Seattle, uh, they kind of know what their business is. Uh, they're much more, because they're looking to own the technology, eventually own the company. They're looking a lot longer strategic, not just uh, a shakedown. In fact, uh, one uh, federal judge uh, her quote was, uh, you will not use my court for a racketeering operation. Very aggressive words to hear from a federal judge, but she knew that this person said, filed so many lawsuits that she basically kicked them out of her courtroom. Uh, that's the sort of thing. The shield is when you have a technology and you just want to protect yourself from uh, other people, you want to practice, uh, I'll file a patent to my invention on this narrow thing and someone says, hey, you're infringing, and you can say, hold up your patent, say, no, I'm not, I'm practicing my patent, um, which is kind of the, the shield. I think there's an uh, issue there with the slide. But at the end of the day, that protector is what you need to be cognizant of rather than um, uh, just getting out there and doing stuff and thinking that you're not infringing, because you could be. Uh, next, I want to talk about market. Uh, toothbrush story went to buy toothbrush the other day, uh, you know, the wall of toothbrushes in the supermarket. And this box said uh, uh, 11 new patents over the existing technology. Um, this is a fuzzy stick. It's a fuzzy stick. And they patented somehow, probably there were a lot of design patents, but 
you know, the brushes went one way and they're made of this material and they went the other way. And somehow they had this, you know, tribe of patent prosecuting attorneys get 11 new patents over a toothbrush. Uh, why did they, are they suing other toothbrush manufacturers? Perhaps, but I think they just wanted to put on the label. So if I saw, you know, old fuzzy stick, 11 new patents fuzzy stick, I'm going to buy the 11 new patents fuzzy stick to brush my teeth. So uh, that's using patents in a marketing context. If you're going for investment capital, the third, uh, fourth area actually we use uh, some IP is to make sure we are being diligent. Yes, we have the file trademarks. Yes, we have a patent portfolio. There's some VCs and investors who just want to see patents. They actually don't evaluate them for, are they good? Are they strong? Are they weak? They just want to see that, hey, are you an innovation engine? If you are, if you have this culture of innovation, then I want to ride with you and here's my money and I want to see you because you have that culture of innovation. Really important for uh, marketing purposes, uh, as well as marketing yourself to potentially investors. So want to get into the layer five and kind of wrap up. I want to hear any questions you may have. So please uh, provide them. Layer five has to do with management. And once you have the culture, once you have the capture, once you have all these layers in place, you've got to manage your IP. Uh, and I basically have one rule on this. Do not register every type of IP or have a, a huge system in IP if you can't manage it. If you do not have the resources to manage that IP, to make sure your registrations are current, to, you know, you, every few years, say for a trademark, you have to uh, have an allegation of continuous use. Like, yeah, I have a monopoly on this word or this picture, and I've been using it continuously for the last five years, pay your fee, and the patent, uh, the trademark office will let you uh, use it exclusively for a number of uh, 10 years and then eventually um, it, it, it can get into a uh, much more valuable mark if it has secondary meaning that, that can stand the test of time, it's incontestable. So at the end of the day, you wanna be able to have only the elements of intellectual property that you can manage and enforce or consciously decide not to enforce. Don't decide not to enforce something because you don't have resources. Um, that's bad because there is no intellectual property cop. The owner, the creator has got to enforce their rights. You can't call some government agency and say, I'm being infringed, sue these people. They're not going to sue them. Now there is some issue, there, there's some help. There's certainly a criminal sanctions for piracy. You certainly can, if you're for registered trademarks, you can actually uh, shut down, the custom service will shut down ship containers so that infringing product doesn't make it in. But uh, there's no one to actually file a lawsuit for infringement, that's you. And you've got to think about, do I have resources in the war chest to enforce my rights? Because if you don't enforce them, you will lose them. Latches, waiver, whatever you want to call it, you can lose your rights if you just let people walk all over you. It's kind of a metaphor for life, I guess. Um, you've got to enforce the produce, the product of your labor, uh, but only uh, go hog wild on creating and registering IP that you can enforce. For example, I had a client, they said, I want trademark, I have these great ideas and I got the domain, so let's do all this. And, and they give me like a list of 10 trademarks they want to register. This is a startup. I said, no, uh, and they have all these art, you know, because art and words are different uh, uh, registration, uh, registrations, different marks. Um, I said, pick five and we'll start there. And if you don't enforce me, you're gonna lose them. Um, much to my surprise, this client was um, pretty savvy and they actually did get more than five trademarks because they were very um, focused on their goal. And their goal was, it was a serial entrepreneur. He knew what he was doing. Uh, 
had a port IP portfolio, brought the value of the company up and sold and retired now has a nice uh, vineyard in Napa. So uh, at the end of the day, you can go into it with your eyes open. If I want five trademarks, am I actually using those in commerce associated with the good or service as shipped or as advertised in interstate commerce? If you're not doing it, don't do it. Uh, you may want to do, if you think you're going to use it, you're pretty good. You may want to file what's called an ITU and an intent to use application, which uh, gives you like six months of runway to decide what you want to do. So that's the rule. Only <laughs> register as much IP as you can do. So just want to go for a, a quick uh, a quick review here. Uh, layer one is a leadership. You got to do your IP audit. You've got to make sure your business systems and your culture are on board with what you're doing in this new era you've discovered, if you don't already have it, of intellectual property. Uh, layer two is capture. I'm going to have to figure out in my contract language and how I onboard and offboard people, both vendors and how I interrelate with my customers if I am indeed capturing the intellectual property I want so I can do something with it useful and, and provide some value or not if I so choose. Third layer, organizational awareness. Everyone has to be on board and look at everything they do in a different way. How many layers of this do I want to work on? How many different flavors of this do I want to surround this thing that I worked really hard on? You know, between initial to uh, commercialization, you can be 15 years, say, in a, a pharmaceutical. It's, it's a lot of work. It's billions of dollars. Uh, you've got to look at it in 3D. Um, you've got to have that awareness. Next, what's your strategy? Fine, we have the IP. It's all wrapped up. Are we going to enforce? Are we going to just use it as a shield? Are we gonna use it as to its marketing potential? Are we gonna use it to fundraise or all the above? And that certainly is a default position. So finally, management. Again, my one rule, register and enforce the intellectual property you have resources fall, uh, for. Do not go for the smorgasbord when you can only eat a small plate. Um, always focus on what you can do with the resources you have. And if you want to get big, um, uh, do more things well, that's good. But start with doing few things well, and then you can scale once resources, market, uh, investment, or uh, anything else um, comes across your bow. Uh, I have a free newsletter. Uh, one uh, for my, if you want, I talk about these topics. I, I mentioned them a little bit. Uh, feel free to sign up, send me an email, um, give me a call if you have questions. Just want to thank Science Docs and uh, University Partners for having me out today. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, I do have one question. Oftentimes our startups have limited resources. What is your recommendation in regards to prioritizing as far as protecting IP? Uh, I think uh, you've got to get that um, confidentiality program in place in solid. Um, that is the, the firewall. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, once you disclose a patent and you start talking about it, the clock is running. And in the United States, it's first to file, which means even though I'm the first to invent, if someone in a bar hears me, hears me talking about it and they file, they just jump ahead of you in line. So you've got to have some type of confidentiality out confidentiality obligation for your team. Um, so two, I have a great trademark. Uh, I don't want to tell people until I publish that and start using it. And when I decide, yeah, we're going to brand in this way, then it's fine. And you can actually, prior to uh, registering that mark, you can put the superscript TM, ask for the common law, because the, the, when you do your application, they'll ask for a first date of use anywhere, and then first date use in interstate commerce. So uh, but before you display and come out with all your brands, you don't want people to scoop up on it who may have may have a prior date of use, which would put you as a junior user. Generally, the junior user a mark loses. Um, uh, also, you know, it, you can have unpublished works, but the minute I publish them, affix them into tangible form and show them to someone else, say outside the company, um, 
that you, the clock is ticking on whether or not you'll get statutory rights, which is 90 days from publication. So you've got to hold those things confidential first and confidence. You don't, there, there are no filing fees and keeping stuff secret. There is internal work you have to do for your organization and get people on board.